Hi everyone, nice to see you all here today. Um, just as we're getting started and people are coming in, I've kicked off the session with a poll. So if you'd like to fill that in while we're waiting um, and that'll give us a bit of insights to help lead the discussion today. So um, welcome to Remote Control. Uh, if you've been to ones in the past, you'll notice today's format is a little bit different to usual. Uh, normally we run through a presentation, which is great, but um, you know, we always enjoy the Q&A ses session section at the end. So we thought, why not make the whole, the whole event a Q&A? So today we're running a panel discussion um, and it's an open discussion. So you know, I'll be asking our panelists here um, some questions, but if you have things to ask, you know, we really want this to be interactive. So please feel free to ask. You can pop your questions in the chat you can also put them in the um, Q&A question as well, if you, if you can see that on your Zoom tab below. And we'll be trying to monitor those throughout the conversation. Uh, if we don't get to them, we'll try and do them towards the end. Um, and hopefully we, we get a chance to kind of connect with you all. So um, I think that's kind of it for housekeeping this morning. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to introduce our panelists. Before I get to that, though, I'm just looking at our poll. We've had a fair few responses so far. So my question was, um, if I can see my question now, you know, what are you most interested in learning from today's discussion? So um, it seems like the bulk of us, 50%, are here for inspiration and ideas, which is excellent. Um, we have 31%. Insights into digital technology use within education. So um, uh, hoping we have a few vendors, other technology providers here today. Um, challenges is also important, 13%. Uh, and oh, one of us is interested in getting started. So great, well, maybe we can connect with you after the session. Um, so just as um, I've just seen a little note pop up in the chat here. And I might, I'll have to get that into in, to that in a moment. Right now, I'm going to introduce our panelists who are here. Um, really happy that uh, everyone could join us today. Appreciate their time. So with us today, we've got a great cross section of people across Smart Campus Spectrum. First up, we have Roy Hart, the Chief Information Officer at BCIT. Roy um, has been with BC. Uh, he has over 30 years' experience leading enterprise IT. Uh, he is the Chief Information Officer at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. And for those on the call who don't know that institution, it is one of uh, Canada's largest post-secondary institution, institutions, over 50,000 students, five campuses. Um, and as the CIO, Roy is responsible for the administration of the entire technology footprint at BCIT. So really happy. Uh, he's also... Um, leading a new smart campus initiative at the institution. So we're really excited to have him chat with us today. Uh, also on the call, um, for those of you who've been with Remote Control before, you may have met Jen MacArthur. She is an associate pr professor at Ryerson University uh, and she's a smart building expert. Um, she leads the smart building analytics group at Ryerson, um, which explores how utilities, transportation, uh, and building use and human behavior can be optimized to really improve a building's performance. Um, on top of that, she has secured over $8 million in funding for um, initial smart campus initiatives and other research. And she is overseeing the development of a, what is called the Smart Campus Integration and Testing Lab. I hope I've got that correct, which um, is the world's, designed to be one of the world's first 100% digitally enabled buildings. Uh, and last but not least, we have Mark Dam. So bringing a different perspective to this discussion, Mark is the CTO at FuseForward. Uh, he has over 30 years experience leading complex IT systems um, and he's uh, experienced particularly with public agencies such as universities and cities. And he's also very passionate about developing um, smart, intelligent digital future for um, organizations. Uh, he's also the leader of or instigator of the Intelligent Systems Alliance, which is a network of academics, industry professionals, engineers that are all interested in big data, machine learning and smart buildings. So without further ado, I'm going to get the conversation started. 
Um, so just to kick off our discussion here today, um, I'm going to start with Jen. Can you start by letting us know what Smart Campus means to you and maybe just giving us a little bit of background about your Smart Campus initiatives? Sure, I'd be happy to. So when I've started working with our facilities management team about seven years ago when I joined Ryerson, and one of the things that really struck me is all of the information we had were stuck in these different silos. And the silos were independent, they weren't interrelated, and there was a lot of opportunity to make much better informed decisions or you know, smarter decisions if we actually had this holistic view. So for me, in a lot of ways, a smart campus is a campus that's broken down these silos and allowed us to have kind of a single point of truth that gives us insight on how all of these different systems interrelate so that we can make better decisions about the systems, but we can also start to optimize how everything works together. And some examples of how we've done that is we've actually taken a look, we've created some uh, virtual campus models of all of the buildings. So we have these BIM models that are mapped with both facility management data in terms of who owns the various spaces and the kinds of occupancy that we see, as well as some of their work order data. And in some of the places, we've got our live building system data as well. So we can actually overlay who tends to occupy these space, the pattern of behavior or patterns of use, because my colleague Bilal actually does work doing occupancy tracking and trying to figure out how those are interrelated. And then being able to look beyond that and say, okay, where we're having complaints, how does this compare to what we're seeing from say the sensor network that's actually operating the building? So we can have a better sense of what types of issues might be causing these problems and how to quickly and effectively resolve them. Okay, excellent. Um, so that's a single point of truth, looking at optimization of buildings and the spaces people are using. Um, Roy, I know you maybe will have a, a slightly different perspective than Jen, um, what does Smart Campus mean to you? And, and maybe you could also give us a little bit of an overview of BCIT Smart Campus activities. Uh, thank you, Carla. So, you know, Smart Campus is, is a wide topic, that's for sure, and can include a lot of things. So the way we've looked at it at BCIT, because we're a very applied institution. So, you know, much to what Jen was talking about, all of the trades come to BCIT to learn. So it's really important that we leverage all of those capital assets in a way that delivers a better learning experience. So our, our focus is really on that aspect of Smart Campus primarily. So for example, in our Center for build, uh, Construction, uh, our School of Construction, uh, there's a huge opportunity there to leverage new technology uh, in the learning experience. So that's really um, the biggest focus of Smart Campus um, for us. Where we are in the journey today is we've taken a look at all of the assets that we have. We have a huge number of assets across the institution, um, all disconnected, all not integrated to each other. And, you know, Jen mentioned the um, single source of truth uh, concept. Well, we, we don't have that today. We don't have it integrated. Integrating it delivers a whole new set of capabilities to the institution, uh, from a, certainly from a, an administrative perspective, running buildings better, that sort of thing. But more importantly, delivering a better uh, student experience, in particular for interdisciplinary studies, where we bring together people from multiple um, different schools to learn uh, things to work together. And that's, that's a big part of uh, what we intend to do with Smart Campus. Right now, we've done that uh, analysis of what we have, and we are working with uh, Fuse Forward, as many of you would know, to build out what that strategy looks like. So it's early days. We're nowhere near as far ahead as where Ryerson is today, uh, but we are looking to catch up and uh, surpass where <laughs> Ryerson is <laughs> in, the, in, the coming, uh, in the coming years. Uh, this is a long game, uh, for sure. Smart Campus is not going to happen overnight, and I think we all know that. Okay. I, love the, I love the competition here. It's, uh, it's gonna it's gonna create everybody striving forward, moving forward, which is all great. Yeah. Well, well, actually, that's a, a good lead into my next question, which is uh, for you, Mark. You know, we're talking. You know, BCIT saying they're trying to catch up with Ryerson. Um, I'm sure these are the not the only universities uh, in Canada, let alone the world, that are looking at Smart Campus. Do you do you see as a technology provider? Do you see that there's a rise in smart campus activities, and and why do you think this is? So so, 
there's a number of factors that are that I think are driving this. And uh, I mean, I've read some interesting articles from Gartner Group about where they think smart campus strategy is in the in the evolution cycle. But I'm going to take a step back about, you know, I'm going to date myself, but 15, 18 years ago. And what we started to do is we started to look at how we could take data coming in from smart metering systems and building automation systems and use it for predictions. And that was things like doing leak detection in water distribution networks, looking at energy consumption models at the city scale as well as at the building scale, and then looking at ways. And I remember working with uh, with Google SketchUp. It was Google SketchUp at the time, and we were doing 3D walkthroughs of pump stations inside utility organizations. Now, all of that was showing that there is new capabilities of technology. Well, fast forward 15, 18 years, and all of a sudden that technology is available in the cloud. The price point is dropped. We have billions and billions of sensoring devices being deployed everywhere. And we're starting to go through and collect volumes of data. And all the researchers are sitting here saying, well, can I go through and create machine learning algorithms? We have cars coming along. I mean, Elon Musk in the Tesla is looking at being a smart, uh, not just a smart car, but basically a self-driving car. Well, that requires a lot of streaming data and control systems. Now, if you take that concept and put it into a campus environment, a campus is a micro city. It's got everything. It's got electric distribution network. It has a water wastewater treatment facilities. It has steam generation on some campuses. It, in some campuses, we also see hospitals. We see research facilities. We have advanced testing facilities. And it's a great showcase for going through and testing all that new tech. Building upon what Roy said, there's also this need to go through and use all of that technology as a driver to help train the next workforce. And it's not just students doing research and learning academic uh, research projects. It's also the trades. It's also the nurses. It's also the technicians working with MRI machines and other types of devices. So when we start creating the ability to look at all the data and all the technology, a lot of campuses are now saying, oh my gosh, can I now turn my campus from being a cost center and just a place to house classrooms to being part of the learning experience and the research facilities that we use today? And that's why I think we're seeing a lot more. And I think this whole nature of COVID and the, the fact that we've now lived through almost two years of being in quote unquote semi lockdown or lockdown and learn to learn, learn to use virtual tools and online systems is driving much more adoption now and awareness that this technology is available and how do we incorporate it into our day to day. Okay, excellent. So a lot there. <laughs> I took some notes. We have, um, you know, rise of smart campus or smart technology. Um, an explosion of data, um, COVID as one potential driver, um, and the need for, you know, improved learning experiences. Um, Roy, you know, I know BCIT is kind of embarking on a smart campus journey. Do your reasons align with this? Did you have, um, you know, what were your reasons for, for getting started? Well, you know, I, I think that what, the way Mark said it is exactly the reasons, uh, fundamentally. Um, when we looked at what we what we have in terms of sensors alone uh, in this disconnected um, you know pillar type model, if you will, we've got over fifteen thousand sensors on campus. Uh, that's a huge amount of opportunity for uh, data to enrich learning, right? So it, it's just a huge opportunity. I'll add to reasons. Um, the technology has reached a level of maturity and a level of understanding in the industry that it makes sense now for us to uh, start worrying about this, if you will, to start looking at ways to leverage it. Because our students come out of our institution to go into employment. That is why we exist, is to train people for the job market. And we have program advisory committees that are connected with industry for that purpose. By going down this path now, we're, we're preparing our students by having them experience the use of that technology across the computer sciences across uh, healthcare, uh, our energy. Uh, Mark mentioned about energy. We have all of those things on campus that he talked about, uh, our school of construction, uh, and so on. Uh, it's it's never ending, uh, the opportunities. And, and we can see uh, a great uh, 
you know, leveling of the playing field for our students by providing them with access to these virtual technologies that come along with having a smart campus and those rooms enabled, uh, the course material updated and enabled, and the instructors trained in order to teach this way and to learn uh, for, so students can learn uh, better. And Mark mentioned capital assets a little bit alluded to. Uh, well, if you can pull some of the learning into the virtual world, away from the physical world, uh, then you can uh, bring more students into that physical space uh, because we can actually scale uh, on the digital world. It's very difficult to scale on the physical world. So if we, if we can bring more students through, we can actually deliver more trained people to the labor market and that's part of our mission. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity. Um, I'm excited. I, I just can't, I can't believe that we're uh, totally aligned across academic, uh, administrative, uh, and our facilities people and IT totally aligned across in order to deliver on this vision. That's uh, it's so interesting. And it's something that, um, you know, when people talk about smart campus, just from my own background and experience, there's a lot of about the student experience. There's a lot about buildings and facilities. And I think what I, you know, is really interesting at BCIT is there's such a focus on like, actually it's for preparing students to be the ones to, to use this technology because that's the way the world's going, right? Mm -hmm. So um, super interesting. Um, so that, uh, Jen, you um, we were sort of saying maybe a little bit further along in some, some of the smart campus initiatives, um, you've been able to demonstrate some really exciting solutions. Um, could you share a little bit about those with us? Yeah, sure. So it's interesting. One of the one of the challenges we've faced is that we keep having a lot of turnover in our facilities management team. And it's just a fact of life sometimes. And on the I see Roy, Roy nodding. So yeah, no, and, and it simply just happens. So we've had a a number of things that we've developed over the years, we have a brand new team who are very excited. And one of the things they're most excited about is the work that we've done for kind of customer service. So we have a centralized work order or kind of help desk sort of setup, and it gets emails, it gets phone calls to this call center. There's a website interface. And, you know, a few years ago, we started working with Mark's team and one of the things that we said is, hey, let's come up with a way of sorting through these work orders, seeing if we can actually figure out and kind of get to the underlying principle of what the, the issue actually is, and then see if we can't make life easier. So our facilities engineer and I sat down together and I said, you know, if you were intercepting every one of these calls, what would you, what would you do? He said, well, I've got a series of questions I would ask them. We've basically been able to create an interface where you can have somebody reporting an issue a bot can actually respond to them and actually give them these follow-up questions so that when it actually does go to the team, they've got all the information into it. We now have the ability to pull up other material from the, the federated data model. So we spent the last couple of years working with Fuse Forward to develop kind of a data model to actually relate all of the campus data that we have access to, and then actually to bring in all of our streaming. So like we've brought on one of the newer buildings alone has 10,000 data points that's streaming at every change of value. So we have kind of enormous, you know, as, as Roy was saying, there's huge amounts of campus data available to us. So we've got that running so we can actually interface that. So we can say, okay, here's the relevant data. Here's an interface that lets you see it. Here's the, an interface that lets you actually cluster all of these different pieces of information so that our facilities engineer, you know, they're not going to necessarily going to be looking at every one of these hundred thousand issues or, or reports or whatever that comes across their desk. But we can flag to them and say, hey, like, this morning, this particular building on campus is really acting up and actually all of your issues are in the northeast quadrant of the ninth floor. It looks like there's a problem with this piece of equipment. And that's kind of, we've been building up all of the different pieces of the puzzle, whether it's the data analytics on the stream building automation system data or a dashboard that actually allows the facilities engineer to navigate their own data in a much more intelligent and seamless way. And we're starting to bring those pieces together so they can actually get this full view and not only be able to see where the problems are, but start to get a sense of why they're happening. And that's a big part of what we're doing kind of for the next uh, three minutes or sorry, three months that we're actually going to be trying to deal with um, basically how do we 
how do we basically very quickly resolve these and actually get right down to the base cause so that we don't have people going out five or six times trying to solve a problem? So that's it's kind of one of those fundamental issues facing our facilities managers in any context. And I think it's one of the biggest things that we've been able to do and start to really bring the different pieces of the puzzle together. I think, you know, one thing that I found interesting too about universities is like we're talking about improving operations and complaints databases and um, being able to identify issues, improving responses to those. I, I mean, sometimes when you think of a university, you don't really realize how big it is. <laughs> so something like that would actually have a huge benefit, right? It, it's not just... Um, you we know. have 66 buildings. Yeah. So, yeah. So rather than sorting through all 66 buildings, we can yeah. say, here's your top five buildings yeah. where you've had the most issues in, you know, do you want to see the last week, the last month, the last year, the last six hours? Yeah. And we can actually start to really filter that in and drill down and start to give people a very quick idea of yeah. where they really need to be focusing their time because none of our facilities management colleagues has has enough time, let alone infinite time to go in and start perusing. We really need to bring the most important things right up to the surface and make it really easy for them to get right to the point. I always think, so Jen, building a button, I always think of the big buttons. When we've always worked with operators of systems, they can't handle a thousand or like all the alerts and alarms coming through. They basically want three, option A, B, or C, and they want a big button to push and say, and they want to understand that. And that, that's kind of a, a little bit of the operation standpoint, eh? And trying to go through and, and sift through all of that data to give that meaningful information. Yeah. Um, and you know, talking about large amounts of data, I think you mentioned ten thousand data points. Like, what challenges did you have implementing these systems? Well, um, I did see the uh, <laughs> the interoperability question that's come up, and I'm not going to jump the gun on that, but that was yeah. definitely a challenge that we had was trying to work around the fact that, you know. All of our systems, and it's not just the building automation system, it's all of our systems tend to be in these locked proprietary boxes, right? So our data is in one of two categories. It's either beautifully structured, but locked. <laughs> it's structured in somebody's closed system that really usually wasn't designed to play nicely with anybody else. Or it's completely unstructured data that's been generated from you know, clipboards or angry emails or phone calls or whatever. So we have this hugely heterogeneous data. And then we have all of these different challenges of trying to really make them fit. So that's something that we spend a lot of time really trying to overcome. We've had to do a lot of like collaborative work with those third party kind of vendors basically to try and get them to output their systems or configure their systems to be able to output. And we actually made that a condition. I was able to be involved early enough on our new building that we basically said, listen, you have to, first off, you have to use this nomenclature that makes the, the data points parsable by our systems and actually match what we're doing with our campus kind of from now moving forward to try and force a little bit of structure that works for us. But the other thing is you have to make this data open, not necessarily internally on the system, but you have to give us a backdoor. We can at least clone what's going on so we can see what's happening, if not have a direct. Obviously, like the facilities engineers have a direct connection into the system. But for them to log into eight different systems simultaneously is, again, it's overwhelming. It's not those nice three buttons that Mark is trying to help people develop. Um, on this topic, I've just seen a, a question come in. So I'm going to jump into this. It says, and I, actually, Roy, I might direct this one to you just, just for the next moment. As a facilities operator, what challenges should I be aware of before allowing new IoT vendors into my buildings? In contrast to the challenges of continuing to, continuing to expand the interoper, interoperability, it's a mouthful, of my existing building automation system. Uh, Roy, did you have, have some comments on that? I do. And, you know, it goes to something that Jen was just uh, concluding on. It's around, you know, how many of these systems are closed um, and they're designed that way. And when you're working with the vendors, they don't want you to actually uh, break open that. Uh, that It's changing a little bit. Um, you're able to, to get further now, at least so, so I'm hearing. But to the question, um, the approach that we've taken, uh, because there's a lot of sensitivity around this, obviously, is a security by design and privacy by design approach from the outset. 
there's lots of concerns about what data is actually collected by sensors and people want to know. Um, so I think an eyes open approach uh, to facilities, including talking with your IT and cybersecurity people. Um, at, uh, at BCIT, what we've done is we created, a, it's, it's actually a separate network for IoT devices that are connected to the network and accessible. Uh, the majority of them still continue to be connected on a very closed system without, uh, without that um, integration. You know, we're not as far ahead, as I mentioned earlier, as uh, where Ryerson is. Um, part of our strategy is to look at exactly how do we make that into a repeatable and scalable um, experience for everybody on campus. So facilities actually knows exactly how these things will be deployed in a more of an engineered solution. And, and if I might uh, just add on a little tiny bit to what Jen was talking about earlier with the, the data sets, there's a huge opportunity for machine learning and AI to augment uh, facilities responses to incidents and events on campus. Um, you know, I, I haven't looked into what the, what the progress is to date on that, um, but I'm sure that some of the research at, at Ryerson is probably tied to leveraging that at this point. Well, maybe I can jump in and just kind of build on, build on Roy's comments. So you got your separate IoT network and just adding on that one. One of the other pieces that we're always aware of just from a cybersecurity standpoint is your building control system should also only be a one-way feed. So you don't want to basically be going through and allowing somebody coming in from, say, a, a corporate network, quote unquote, a business with an application and let it go the other way. So it's more of a feed that comes out that allows you to go through and still use the data as a means to go and monitor and see what's going on without providing the two-way control systems in there. And we dealt with that with, with Jen and the, the folks at Ryerson. It was a specific requirement. It's like, you can't touch my systems. And even at the BCIT, there's always um, the engineers and the facility managers are very much protective because they've got a safety requirement. I can't let anybody accidentally change how my HVAC systems work. And it's a totally fair premise. So the question is, is how do you still leverage and use the data coming out, but have it so that there's a one-way feed and not the reverse control system controls going back in? So, and you can do that all with firewalls and, and other technologies to drive that, which is per Roy's comments. Okay, um, Jen, I mean, this is, a, this is an interesting question. Did you have anything to, to add to that? Um, like I said, it's... For us, it was, we were definitely using privacy by design. And I think that's something that we were certainly, it was certainly on our radar to talk about, but yeah, no, it's, it really is a challenge of the interoperability. I think for a lot of it is to make sure that the format is gonna be usable. Sometimes it's as simple as that as making sure that the data that you're gonna get out can be structured fairly easily, can be machine readable. So, so even just making sure that people are using the same format exactly for the room names so that as we actually go to upload this data and actually start to map it, we can actually use our existing database that we've actually, or our, our data model for the campus, right? You don't want to be having people starting to add hyphens or take hyphens away or replace a hyphen with a period or with a space or adding another digit. It seems really innocuous. But then NMC Roy nodding the number of systems that have slightly different variations on how all the room names are. and we have it too. Like we're guilty of the same thing when we're trying to integrate our systems. We actually have to have these lookup tables or pre-processing to actually reformat, say, even just the name of the building or and update it to our current naming convention for all new buildings so that we can actually link the data together for when we try and bring on like an, an older building or an older system. Um, another big one is to make sure that it's properly documented, right? We've had to go through a lot of the problems with legacy systems is you don't have the documentation. So we've had to go through and actually create like classification algorithms to be able to see this, you know, non-readable point, or it's like auxiliary one and you're going, well, what is auxiliary one? Well, so now, you know, one of our, one of our team members has actually created an algorithm being able to say, well, actually it's a temperature and it's specifically a discharge temperature temperature for this kind of unit. And if we do some clustering, we can even identify which unit it's related to and which room it's serving and actually be able to create that map. But that's a lot of work. If you can just get the proper documentation so you know what's connected to what and how they relate to the existing campus systems, you can save yourself an enormous amount of work. So I think for a new system, that would be a huge one for the IoT. Because the IoT sensors still have places 
but they're going to they're going to kind of think about themselves as part of a network in terms of which controllers and which sensors and which wireless addresses they're connected to they're not necessarily going to be named with i'm serving you know the gymnasium in building 43 on campus right so it's just a matter of making sure that that there's enough in, like useful metadata about the points that they can be reasonably mapped and tied into the systems and i think that will save a world of hurt for the facilities managers later on great so uh lots of lots of interesting um suggestions there i always find it interesting that you have these like extremely smart um like futuristic type type systems and it's always like comes down to like dashes hyphens <laughs> data organization like stuff that you don't see under the you know when you're looking at the end product um so we have a few more questions here um, i might just jump back into a couple of mine right now so just bear with me for a second um and this is kind of on the same topic so this one's for you mark um We've talked a lot about the benefits of Smart Campus and, you know, some of the, the cool things we can do with them. Um, from your perspective as a technology provider or um, solutions provider, what are the biggest challenges you see for institutions that are about to embark on these kinds of projects? You know, there's a, there's a general rule of thumb. People, process, and technology, okay? And the, the technology is always the easy part in a lot of cases. And while we heard a lot from Jen and, and Roy about networking and data standards and everything else, well, that's the technology side of the house. And actually, we actually know what to do there. Um, we know how to go through and, and get it working. Um, it, it, it's time and effort to do it, but that, those aren't the biggest ones. The biggest challenges in a lot of cases is going to be the barriers to adoption, organization and people side of the house. And then also on the process side, can we get people trusting the systems? I still remember a project we did with, uh, with a, a, uh, an organization, a restaurant chain. And one of the things that we had was, well, we can actually do forecasting. We can actually go through and use data. We can do great things and tell you what to do and, and provide you with the best decision support system out there. But they wouldn't trust it. They thought that their judgment was better and that they would be able to go through and do it. And that's a people issue. That, and then if we look at it and it's like, well, then the process is underneath is how do we make sure that the data coming in and the decisions going out are actually being trusted and incorporated into say a capital investment program or standards for building new buildings. Those are all the kinds of things that I see are the, are the bigger issues of adoption uh, of the smart campus. And th this kind of goes back. I mean, this is, this is talking about 30 years of experience of building large complex IT systems. It's always come down to the same. We can still do the tech, Technologists are great, but we always run into the people process issues and, and helping to go through and get everybody to say, I'm used to that and I want to do that and I want to leverage that and I trust those systems. And those are the ones that I see are still going to be the, uh, the, the, the challenges that we have to continue to address moving forward. Okay, so that's a good segue to a question that I have here from the audience um, talking about people. Uh, this is, what are the top three things I know you like threes, Mark, so I'm <laughs> directing this at you, uh, that we can do as a, from a facility manager, as a facility manager, to help empower building oper operators to become more effective. So um, more from the facility side here, how, what would you recommend to them? So uh, there, there, is, there is an embracing it to do that, and, and it's kind of the ability to go through and trust the data. Um, we can pull the data out. We've got our building control systems, but one of the things to empower them is to give them access into a single repository of how all that stuff does. It's working together. So as an example, there's many organizations where there are facilities groups. Every building has got a different building management system on it and it runs independent. And there is no way to correlate, nor is there a way to manage the alerts and alarms or the set points across buildings. So being able to go through and give them that single integrated repository to learn from building A, how to go and configure building B and C and D, and be able to go through and allow them to experiment with different set points in their building control systems on their HVACs or, their, or any of the other control systems that they have. Those are the key things that I look at from the control standpoint. The other one is, is of course, there's an educational component. One of the other things uh, to go through and empower the building operators, we need to educate them. We need to give them and let them understand the power of the technology and how to use it. Um, so a lot of cases, it's, it's usually in the hands of third-party contractors. 
And what you really want to be able to do is start creating the linkage between the, the facilities manager, the facility owner, and the service provider, who in a lot of cases in the building world is actually um, third party vendors that are actually doing the field services work. So we want to create a way for all of those organizations to basically be able to speak a common language. So those are those are a couple. I don't know if I got a third. I think that's kind of <laughs> okay. So any anyone else have anything to add, uh, Void? Yeah. yeah, I need I need some more. So so yeah, I, I'm, I'm coming. Other folks here. I'm coming from a very different context where our facilities management team is. We've got to kind of our facilities engineers, but then we have kind of our building operators and managers who are you know under resourced. Their jobs have you know expanded to to fill, you know, the star, sun, the moon, the starry sky is all part of what they have to do. And a lot of, a lot of our team have been in the job for a lot of years, right? And they've got, they've, they're used to having everything in their head and being, being the single source of truth. And I think a lot of it is really just kind of working with people to figure out where, what the fault needs are. I think a big, one of the big top three things you can do as a facility manager, listen. Like, I think it's really important to listen to your team, figure out kind of what their pain points are. And if we can actually address kind of the things that are keeping them up at night that are making their lives difficult and start to demonstrate how the technology can actually simplify and get rid of some of the challenges that they have, I think that's the way of really starting to get buy-in from people who might otherwise see this as a threat, right? And because no, we're not, none of these systems are ever going to replace the know-how that our teams have in the field, but it's very easy to be concerned that that's going to be a risk. So to, to be able to see this as an assistive technology as something that can actually help them to do their job more effectively, more efficiently, and spend less of the time doing some of the boring things. I think that's really important. And I think just recognizing that there's a journey that people have to make and and just to listen to, and to have those conversations. And like I said, I agree entirely with Mark about giving them the opportunity to actually engage with the system as it is. And sometimes it's actually being able to see the data from other people's silos. You know, they can't, everybody needs to know that nobody's gonna be able to mess with their, their data. Nobody's gonna be able to mess with what they're doing in their system, but to be able to have that view into access of other people's systems to better understand what's going on, I think actually tells its own story of how how powerful and important this is. And I think that's one of the things that if you can get the people on board, then it really does make all the difference in the world. I, wow. I'd like to add on to that a little tiny bit. You know, it what Jen and Mark have said is is exactly what what needs to happen. The the approach that um, you know is often effective is help people see what the art of the possible is. Like what like what what is possible and, you know, make sure that we don't leave any stones unturned in that, uh, in that way. Um, kind of get that shared vision of, of you know, what, what would you like to do? So much to what Jen said, you know, ask them what will, will, help, uh, will help them with their jobs uh, and then show them that it's actually possible and build that roadmap and, and actually take action and deliver on that promise. Uh, like that's really uh, what we have to do, get people excited. Um, and I think it goes a little bit beyond uh, what Thomas's question was, but really get people excited about what's possible, help them be part of implementing it, help them be part of delivering it, um, and really uh, create a more interesting job, uh, fundamentally. Uh, and most people want a more interesting job. That's, uh, that's fantastic. You know, I'm really great answers to that question and you know some of them <laughs> getting a bit inspirational there when it was um you know a question about facility managers and the top three things they can do to get people excited about this um so that actually we've been talking about facilities i kind of want to bring it back to the education side now i have a question here from sharon and she says hi i'm an instructional designer as we are discussing um smart campus would you please also talk about the smart classroom, especially, especially the educational technology um, innovation within the classroom? So, you know, can we talk about the educational technology innovation and also how do you design classroom technology innovation when thinking about smart campus? Um, so this is, a, this is a, a good question. And I'm wondering, Roy, if I could put you on the spot to start with this one. Well, you know, I, I'm happy to talk about it a little bit, but I am not an educator, so I don't make any presumptions <laughs> or assumptions on in that regard. Yeah. Uh, what I can say is that um, 
you know, uh, AR and VR is heavily used. Those are uh, very important parts of uh, the academic experience here at BCIT. We use it across uh, many of our different programs across multiple schools. Uh, when it comes to a classroom, well, in our context, the classroom is, uh, is also working with the equipment and everything else. And as I mentioned, it's augmented by AR and VR. We have things like a virtual pulse. Uh, we have things like a, um, a helicopter. Um, we have simulators for excavation equipment and everything along the way. So instructional designers really have to uh, bring all that together into a cohesive story that can be delivered as an education, as a, as a course material, really. And that's what uh, I know that our educational, uh, uh, our designers and consultants have been doing, um, especially during COVID. It's been amped up uh, big time. And, you know, I'll leave it at that uh, because, you know, Jen can, you know, is on the academic side, she can go way further than I could. All right, I'll take, take it from here. Thanks, Roy. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, teaching online for the last year and a half, it's really opened our eyes, I think, as faculty to the opportunity for digitization. And and obviously, like, you've got the obvious, you know, you can teach remotely. We're, we have a lot of actually hybrid classes this year. So we actually have students in the classroom where we'll have half of the students come in on a particular day. And then we have other students joining remotely. So we do have, you know, the video camera set up to actually broadcast the big screen so that the students in the class, classroom can actually see the students as they're dialing at home. They can kind of start to get that sense of community. But we do do a lot more interesting things because I teach in an architecture department. Some of my colleagues have done some phenomenal work with um, AR and VR. So we've done an augmented reality project where our students could actually take a model of the building that they're designing and actually go to their site and actually look at it and actually display it on a tablet and see their model actually on the building site. So they can actually get a sense as they walk around, how is this building actually gonna behave in its actual environment rather than just trying to do this on a rendering or doing it within a 3D environment. We do a lot of uh, virtual reality. So I've had a few students actually bring it into the studio and we actually explicitly introduce it in first year as a tool. So during design reviews, I'm quite used to actually going through and putting on the VR goggles and actually having my students walk me through a building and actually show me what's going on. And then we've had, I've had people come in from industry with the photogrammetry or the LIDAR and actually literally scan my classroom. So the students can actually see kind of over the course of this program, they'll, they'll give some examples from the field and then they'll, at the end of it, they'll actually bring up and people can actually see the 3D laser scan of them sitting right there in the classroom and they can get a sense of the power of the technology and really the inspiration to actually go and make use of it in real life. So those are some of the things. I think some of the other things is as we give our students access, I've, we have shared some of the digital twins that we've made with our students who've then used it for whether it was energy modeling or energy optimization ideas or solar studies or any other kind of studies, being able to actually engage with buildings that they live in and work in digitally as well as physically, I think gives them an enhanced perspective. And pedagogically, I find that really valuable. Let me, let me kind of add a little bit to this because we've got a couple of different contexts here. And I always think about this, thinking about Sharon's question from an instructional designer standpoint. One of the things that I've always kind of always looked at is what is the engagement process from the student's learning experience? And what is the journey that they go through through that learning process? So if you think about this from an instructional design perspective, one of the first things that we look at is how do we get the students to want to register for a course or even register for to join the university or college? Okay, so that's kind of part of a marketing program. What can we use in the way of, as, we, as we've heard here, new kinds of digital wayfinders, um, camp, virtual campus tours that allow us to go through and show the capabilities within a, smart, within a campus environment using the virtual world in the way of a virtual tour. So that's at the very beginning of the engagement with the student, and that should be one part of that process. But one of the things I've learned over my years is that People that learn, they go aware, they go through a process of awareness, through a little bit of capability, and then eventually, hopefully, ending up into being uh, somewhat of an expert in a certain field. Now, how do we take them along that learning journey? And then, what are the digital components or the smart asset, smart campus components that can be used on that journey? So, I've talked about the wayfinders, the marketing. When you get into a course content, 
some of the things that we think about are, well, can we go through and create some of that online training content where they're actually doing, say, a SimCity or a Sim Campus as their mechanism to go through and do things. One of the things we've learned in some of the uh, research that we've done is when the trades are going in and working on heavy equipment, it's a very unsafe environment. And do you really want them going underneath and working with, uh, with really um, nasty chemicals and tons and tons of equipment when, before they actually try and do it themselves in a virtual world and using it so it's a little bit more of a safer environment? Then as you go along, you start getting along further along and then it becomes more of an interactive where Roy was talking about this process of using those kind of simulators to teach drivers how to drive backhoes. And then when you start getting in and they start touching that physical gear, the new world like aircraft, manu aircraft maintenance technicians, they use AR, AR and AV goggles while they're actually working to get all the safety manuals and all of the repair manuals. And that gives them the content. So when you're thinking about this from an instructional design perspective, think about the journey of that student through that process and how they go from an awareness, but incorporating that whole digital campus and digital content and digital classroom into that whole content sharing environment and that kind of experimentation and usage and, and the tacit experience of touch. And those are the kinds of things that we think about on that journey of the, of the student. That's, that's fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Um, we've got a, like a fair few questions here <laughs> um, and we're, we're coming towards the end. There's one particular one I think would be good for Jen. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to put that one live now, but it says occupants have an impact on the operational efficiency of our buildings. What can we do or have we done, done to influence the behavior of occupants to improve the sustainability in the built environment. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the, um, we say that occupant behavior is about plus or minus 25% on your building performance. So it really is absolutely huge. And while I can't answer the question in terms, what can we do yet? One of the buildings that we actually are making, like our, our prototype smart building, one of the use cases that we have that comes from facilities management is we've actually designed that building to actually exactly support this kind of research. So hopefully a year, year or two from now, we'll actually have a really good answer for you. But we've, got, we've actually got six floors of the residence tower that we've actually really heavily censored. So we can like system by system, suite by suite, room by room. So we can actually look at how the occupants are behaving different behavior and actually we can actually gamify so we can we're actually planning our facilities department or sustainability department is actually gamifying the residence tower and pitting floor versus floor versus floor and all of the floors have their own sub meters you can actually see which building can actually decrease and I've, I've heard this before right like the way that you can actually get people to start to close the fume hoods I was talking to a friend a couple days ago they had this research lab they dropped their fuel costs by 20%, like by the end of the month, by basically promising free pizza to the department that could actually <laughs> reduce their energy use associated with leaving their fume hoods out. So they were going to do spot checks of fume hoods in the lab that most consistently went and closed it. And because after a month, you've created new habits, their energy bills dropped 20%. There's right? the, so there's, I think there's in a lot of ways, you have the to give a challenge. <laughs> Yeah. That's the people challenge. Absolutely. And I think, but sometimes I think it's just a matter of making people aware of what's happening and making people like motivate, motivating people in kind of fun and creative ways. So I think gamification is actually a huge opportunity and it's definitely a line of research that we're seeing. That's a, a brilliant uh, answer and <laughs> quite amusing. Um, so uh Bringing on this, maybe the last one we might take, um, depending on how we go, but I'm actually going to direct this to you, Roy. Um, and th this is a broad term. Have any of the panelists implemented a digital twin? And if so, how was it implemented and what impact? Oh, sorry. Apologies. That's a great question, but I have a, <laughs> a different one here. I read the wrong one. Um, this is a long question. Message level authentication is regarded as the best way to prevent impersonation in decoupled applications. Um, I'm going to put this on the screen so you can see. Um, but it's very difficult to implement. Um, this makes, okay, this is quite technical. 
This makes middleware systems compromise the best way to attack a data store algorithm application via impersonation. Um, I think just to summarize, what do you see as the best strategy for establishing integrity of and sender identity for the information that gets fed to ML AI systems? It's a tough one, Roy. I'm going to pass that to you. Well, you know, really, this is kind of a, a question that um, it, it, it's a long question and a debatable one to get to get into. Um, and I think, you know, for the purpose of today and, and what we're talking about is to really focus on the fact that when you go down this path, you're going to put, uh, you know, sec security by design as a first premise. So every single system that you implement and connect will follow a set of standards that are meant to do something that Mark mentioned earlier, which is one way transmission of the data. And the other part that Jen mentioned was then in essence to, to respond in a sort of technical way to do that extract, transform and load of that data into that reporting system on the back end that can then leverage AI and machine learning. So I think there's many, many steps that we go through before we get to the point of getting down to specifically how are we going to prevent impersonations and, and things like that. In the case of BCIT, where we are right now, it's a separate network, it's kept separate, the data is kept separate, and uh, we operate it separately. And through our exercise over the next, you know, probably few years, we're going to figure out exactly how to uh, do, uh, Ash, what you're what you're talking about here and keep that data secure. And Jen, I'm sure there's probably some experience with this at Ryerson to date. Uh, and Mark, uh, I know you have insights on this as well. Yeah, I, I mean, a couple of pieces on this one just to, to build upon it is, you talked about the, there's a question in there about the middleware system. So a lot of people was like, what is middleware? Middleware is software that runs on servers in a data center. And a lot of that is, is how do we go through? And if you start wrapping all of your application systems and middleware systems with the proper authentication protocols and standards around that, using multi-factor authentication and all of the tools that are available, those are your methods of going through and making sure that they're locked down. One of the other parts that we kind of hear to separate networks, well, the other one is don't ever put any of your control systems on the internet. Rule number one, <laughs> don't use the internet. OK, um, for there are certain ways and certain systems that that can reside on an Internet based system. But there's also topology models for how to go through and segregate application workloads. And then even within the application, working on making sure you have um, zero trust and you also have immutable images of your server images that have gone through security protocols and security testing before they ever go through. This is not a simple question. It's not like, hey, it's as simple as a. It's not. It's, it's a, as, as Roy said, security by design. And that means even to the point of writing code and making sure that all the code is written and going through security checks before it's ever released into production. Um, that's fantastic. And I know we have one final question. Um, it's a broad one. And I think, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we'll have time to cover it all. Um, have any of the panelists implemented a digital twin? And if so, how was it implemented and what impact did it have? Um, Jen, I might pass this to you, um, but I'd also like to flag, we do have some material about this topic, so we can share this with you, Thomas, if we don't get a chance to, you know, dive fully into this right now. Given that we don't have much time, I'll give the 30 second. <laughs> the, yeah. the digital twin is the topic of our current five-year collaboration with uh, Fuse Forward. So, we are, like we said, we're, we're in our second year of this collaboration and our big steps, create a data model that allows us to actually bring all of this data into a single source of truth, which we've done. We've got a, we've got a relational database, but we've also got some time series databases that live on the Fuse Forward platform in their data lakes. The second piece is set up all of the data streaming and the sensor fusion and integration so that not only can we stream the data from these systems, but we can actually bridge across to actually make the data that we're getting make sense. And sometimes that's being able to map a network of Wi-Fi sensors to actually start tracking kind of crowd movement and get a sense of how agents might be moving within those sent those uh, areas or get a sense of a water flow network to get a sense of what the, rel the relative flows are. And then the third piece is to come up with, you know, 
the predictive analytics that you need to actually like what are the what if analysis we want to have to have what are the functionalities the scenarios that we want to be able to run in the digital twin what do we want the digital twin to be able to display and of course the one that wraps around all of that is actually creating the digital twin so we've been doing a lot of work using uh, the forge platform being academics that's a uh, we, we tend to use a lot, of, a lot of Autodesk products in our teaching. So it wound up being kind of a natural way of looking at that, but then complementing that with some of our laser scanning and our LIDAR and our, you know, photogrammetry and thermo, thermal imaging to be able to really complement and build that up to actually start to create this digital twin that we can actually engage with that actually has a little bit more than your standard kind of building information modeling, kind of the usual out of the box models. To, to, I'm just going to go and give two p one one more comment on that one, just so that we kind of got that. Digital twins are not the answer. Digital twins is the environment in which you basically overlay data to go through and see what's going on. And and Jen, the one part that really blows me away from what the researchers are doing is when we started getting those thermal images and overlaying the thermal images on the 3D models in the digital twins those started to show where all the heat was escaping inside the building or outside the buildings. And that starts giving you very good areas to go through and say, there's our, there's our leaks. There's where we're getting energy leaks, air leaks and everything else. And we can sit here and say, well, that starts giving us good visualizations of what's going on with the real-time data. And that to me is really the power of a digital twin is being able to visualize all of that and see it and overlay all of that sensoring data and everything on top of that and be able to walk through it all. Um, that's fantastic. And um, I'd love to hand it over to you, Roy, but I think we're coming up on our, our time here. So I'm just going to do our last, um, share our last couple of screens here. Let me make sure I'm sharing the right one. So um, here we are towards the end. So. You know, we had a really great discussion today. Um, I know we probably didn't get to everyone's questions. We really enjoyed having you. Um, you know, if you're interested in connecting, you want to get started with a, a Smart Campus project, um, I've popped, uh, you know, a couple of details up on the screen here. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I could set up time for an introduc introductory call with Mark. Um, and, you know, he can look at ways of helping you to get started, whether that's a proof of concept pilot project or just a chance to get to know each other. Um, we're equally as interested to find out what kind of projects you're working on as well. So um, putting that up there, I believe that um, Daria may be able to share those details in the chat. And if not, um, we'll be sharing this uh, session with everyone who registered. So look out for our email. You can get in touch with us by responding to that. Um, and just a final note here. First of all, I'd like to thank the panelists for their time. You know, really appreciate you getting on, sharing your thoughts. It's a super interesting discussion. So I think, you know, I appreciate it, it and so does everyone else. Um, for those attending, Remote Control is actually a series. So we've been running these for, you know, it'll be two years soon. Um, we, uh, you can subscribe to get updates about what's coming up. Um, and you can also follow us on social media. Um, we post regularly about what's happening along with other news and updates. Um, so plenty of ways for you to stay in touch and, you know, get involved in future. Um, uh, thanks again for your time, everyone, and look forward to seeing you again.